Call to order the Board of Equalization for the City of Dickinson, Tuesday, April 19th, 2022. Let the record show that all commissioners are present. First item up is, has the clerk been issued a copy of the public uh, notice and this meeting has been published. Uh, Mr. President, commissioners, uh, the, the work has been completed. The meeting has, has been properly noticed. Okay, and you said that your work as a local assessor has been completed and all assessments entered into the assessment role. That is correct. Okay. At this time, commissioners, um, I guess we would have the option if there was someone from the public to we could continue with the board of equalization um, or jump into the abatement it looks like we have one member of the public here right now sir are you here for the board of equalization uh, yeah, I'm just okay. okay we can uh, proceed in <coughs> with this gentleman since he's the only one and then we can proceed with the abatement that way he doesn't have to listen through the abatement. Do you need a motion? Yes. Uh, so moved. So a motion to proceed with the equalization. Um, anyone that's present or wants to call in, and we have a second. All in favor, state aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Sir, have you uh, contacted the assessor's office? Uh, yes. Okay, why don't you come forward and state your name and present. Good afternoon, commissioners, mayor, the public. Uh, my name is Brett Messel. I live over on the, I believe it's Washington 4th edition. I had sent an email to Joe Hirschfeld. Is that how you say it? Um, and haven't had a response back. Um, I was about 12 hours late of the April, was it 7th, that we had to have them in by. Um, and I just have some general questions about the assessment on my house. Um, it went up $63,800 um, from just in 2021. And I guess my questions are, um, what, what was the reasoning and where does the assessors and the assessment come from that they have evidence that my house increased by 63,000? Mr. Um, House, could you give me your address, please? Yep, it is 1233 A Street East. Um, there was no improvements done. Um, comparing houses in the same neighborhood, across the street, the houses that have recently sold, um, and they all went up between 15, we'll say between 10 to 20,000. Um, I guess what my question, why did mine go up 63,800? Um, does the city use estate software that they input it do they, you know, how do they, do they drive to the front of my house, look at it? Well, I know they don't because the, actually the picture on the website is the same picture from Google Maps. Um, you can type out my address. It's the same picture that's on the website. So I know that they didn't come out and actually assess my house. Um, I got the letters in the mail saying, you know, we'd like to come and assess your house. We were in the middle of moving in. Um, unfortunately, there were some other circumstances that we didn't plan for at that time. And I apologize that the letters kind of got pushed off to the side. I had a family to move in. Um, we had to do some remodeling and, and so forth that was not planned. Um, my next question is, what is the process the city used to approve or decline a request for reduction in the assessed value of a property? And how does specific demographic of a neighborhood affect the value of residential property, such as roads, streets, trees, city lights, fencing, that kind of stuff? And maybe they don't at all. Brett, you say your, your name is Met, last name is Metzel? Metzel, M-E-S-S-A-L-L. -S -S -L. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what I would like, if, if you're able to, is for us to have you sit down with, sit down physically today with them 
yeah. and they can address your specific issue. And if they don't, if you can't come to, if that, well, whatever that explanation is, is not satisfactory, that you can come back to us. Can okay. Mr. Hirschfeld saying yes, that can happen. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Okay, because I would like you to sit down and, and have your concerns answered directly by okay. the you know, staff okay. on that. Um, just, just Hirschfeld or somebody can presently or, or do you, do you need to, we need to proceed with abatement and then you'll address it afterwards. Uh, Mr. President, commissioners, uh, I have a staff member here who was probably at your house. If, it, if you had purchased it this year, that was going to be my, my first question back to you. Uh, Heather, would you mind taking a moment to sit down with him and kind of explain, uh, his value to him? And then by all means come back here and we can go from there at least that way uh you're at the same page i am and, and the rest of us I, I apologize i did get your email uh I, I didn't forward that to my staff we were still putting binders together i mean that's how tight our time frame was uh not a good excuse i apologize for that but we will go ahead and make sure we answer all of your questions adequately tonight for you so. okay and that's why you know i kind of came okay. to the meeting because i hadn't got an email back so you know, I understand everybody busy, not like we didn't get 30 inches of snow or anything. So, but I guess that's why I came here was just to see if I get some answers here. Okay. So I think if you meet with Heather in the back. Okay. So you know. Did you say they, somebody came out and actually walked the property since you bought it? Inside? No, from, from, from my knowledge, no. Because okay. when you go on to like the tax, let's see if I can find a picture of it here. Yeah, when you print out this from the Dickinson City Assessor's website and you go to just Google Maps, type in my address, that's the exact same picture. Okay. So that's telling me that they physically did not go out and, and even look at my front door. Um, and the time that this picture was taken, I know for a fact we were still in the process of moving in because that's the last enclosed trailer that we had. Okay. That had our... Had our stuff that we didn't need right away and you bought it last year yeah it was in june of last year okay if you if you would meet with the, the staff member and they could address your questions yep okay thank, thank you. you thank you is there anyone else from the public that wishes to come forward or call in 701-456-7006 Control room, make sure that uh, any calls are piped into the meeting chamber. We're holding the Board of Equalization. You may come forward. Please state your name for the record and let us, the Commission, know any of your concerns. Okay. Hi, my name is Daniel Doletsky. Um, can I pass out my current assessment sheet? And could you give the, uh, the Commission your address? Oh, you have it on there? Okay. Um, so as I said, my name is Daniel Dletsky. I live at 1300 West High Street. Um, I took over ownership of the property in September or October of 2020 um, when the current value of the home was $559,000. Um, at that time, I was given a letter from the assessor's office. Um, I allowed them to come into my home and do an inspection, um, not an estimate, so a little more thorough of an uh, evaluation was given. Um, and in uh, you know March of 2021, my value changed to $602,000, a 7% increase. Um, at that point, I contacted the assessor's office, um, spoke to, you know, my, the only thing changing was my name on the title. Um, they said some things were updated on the card that weren't previously, you know, on there. Um, okay, I can see that. They said once uh, they come and do like neighborhood assessments or there's a change in assessment, means my card had been updated 
there would not be such a large increase on my property value. Um, so now the 2022 value, I get a letter uh, 12 months later for another 6% increase or 38,000. Um, own the home for about 18 months. I've had about 6,000 in changes. Um, maybe some ceiling fans. I updated a fireplace insert, um, some knobs on the doors, some hardware. Um, ripped out some trees, which probably devalues the place. Trees are expensive. Um, so I've seen a 13% increase in 18 months when adding no value to the home other than, like I said, about six to $8,000 of changes. Um, so I feel that uh, I haven't added any value to the home in 12 months, um, but yet I see a $38,000 increase to my property value after just seeing a 7% increase, just not that much time before that. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Dulitsky? Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Dulitsky's been in contact with our office over the past couple of years, done a good job communicating his concerns to us uh, with the purchase of his house last year, he did allow us in. Uh, my appraiser found the, the uh, property record card to be inaccurate, and so there were some corrections made. Uh, those <coughs> corrections ended up in increasing the value of the property, uh, and that was what happened last year. And then this year, uh, according to the changes of the market and the increasing marketplace throughout, he received the same increase that everybody else did in town, and that increase was outside of any, any additions or any... Uh, additional uh, money is being spent on the property. Uh, another part of the, his concern was having his property card updated uh, when the rest of his neighborhood isn't. Uh, that's not a new concern. It's a concern that I share and have shared with you as well. And that's just uh, part of the process of trying to complete the residential revaluation and getting clear across town and making sure everybody's property record cards are updated. His neighborhood hasn't been uh, inspected yet. You know, we haven't done our revaluation in that area. So when that does occur and his neighbors see then the, the corrections to their property card, his should at that time already be updated unless of course there's any changes made to the property uh, since last time we were there and the next time we get there. So there's, there's 29 houses on West High Street um, none of them have seen a change in property value in five years. Mine's seen two changes in 18 months, or actually 12 months, um, at a 13% increase, whereas they've seen zero or six this year, I guess. And I understand the resources that the city has in the assessor's office, however, to be assessed 7% and to you know, come in with professionals that can assess the value of my home and tell me what it's worth, I feel that that needs to hold some sort of value for some period of time. I understand the housing market values change, but to just see it in 12 months later, say it's increased 6% across the board when other neighborhoods haven't seen any change in years, when the price of property has clearly increased over that same time frame. I guess this is this is where I've I voiced my concerns in the past about when a house sells and we go in and assess it right after it sells. To me, that is the value when it sells. I know you have a, a counter argument to that, Joe, that you the card needs to be updated and everything, but that it to me has always been that is what the value is. That is the market value. Unless you have a red flag that it is not an arm's length transaction distress sale, et cetera, et cetera. Something that you can put on your card. Um, and with our limited resources, I've, I've said this before, that I think we need to concentrate on, on doing these neighborhoods. Now, um, like I said, I've made this argument before about what a, when a house sells, a house sells, and that's what its value is. Um, and, and your office has its reasons, but then I think this is what happens. We, uh, we end up getting people, we double them up. So to, to kind of add to that, so if, even if you 
did that and I bought my house for say $200,000, you issue that as the property value, how long does that value hold, hold weight until what, the, six months later when they, a year later when they add another 6% blanket to the entire city? There has to be s some period of time where a property can hold value whether you are following the sales price or following what the assessor comes in and tells you what your house is physically worth based on their, their metrics and measurements. I mean, I mean, looking at the value for, I mean, there's a recorded sale on your property card. I mean, if you take, we try to, we have to by state law stay between 90 and 100 percent. So if you take it by 95 percent, which would be the middle, just mm -hmm. to say, 598, 500, would it should have been your value probably in 2021, and you were at 600. And exactly. Roughly 602,000. 602,000. Yeah. I mean, and now you're at 640 which has exceeded your sales price I mean but some of that is market related and I mean no, we use a lot we use a lot of data to pick that up Joe maybe you can explain it a little bit but um, so I, I I think we were close in the you know the 21 assessment the 22 assessment maybe you can explain a little bit more there Joe so uh, Mr. President uh, Commissioner Frederick I understand the concerns of the president. I understand the concerns of uh, Mr. Doletsky here. There, there isn't anything in Century Code or the guidelines that the state tax office has that allows us to leave that property value. Our requirement is market value. The threshold is 100% uh, as the median. So when you look at an entire city, when you, when you think median, half the property is gonna be above that you know, or overvalued, if you will, but it's still valued market, so it's still, still accurate, and half are going to be below median. Now, we do get a range down to 90%, which allows us to, to have that uh, value drop a little bit off of 100, and so there, there's a little bit of leeway in that, so most of the properties end up being valued less than what their sale price was, but that's no guarantee because we, we go by the median uh, of the entire town, and so, uh, as an assessing office, the most important properties that we use to set our value are the sales, and that's why we try to make sure our, all of our sales are accurate. If we left a sale of a property at where it was at, none of the increases would ever come on because, you know, like, like this year, we, we, we raised the value 6 7%, depending on your land value, and that, that's market-driven. That's the desire for people to move to Dickinson and pay more for a house than what it was worth the year before. And we have no control over that. And so if the market decides next year to go up 20%, then we would have to add value to that. There's no chance for, as Mr. Dulesky is asking for that value to rest. Uh, before any of you commissioners were on here, when I first started in 2011, 12, 13, we added value to some properties of 30, 40, and 35% in back to back to back years because of the oil boom, the demand for housing and people willing to pay more than what that property had ever been worth historically. And you, you want to talk about concerned citizens, and I mean the same concern that Mr. Dulesky had, but we had three and four and 500 people who would be willing to come through our office, you know, concerned about that, and rightfully so, but that's a reaction to the market because state law says we're supposed to value it at what the market would be willing to pay. And so the initial increase uh, ended up with his property being accurately valued, reflecting the sale price, which I think we were right near where, where the value was. And then this year's value is that increase of, of 6%. And just noting that this year's market would have paid that much more for the property than last year's market. That what Mr. Dulesky paid for it. I, I can appreciate the concern that, you know, you, you just bought the house and now your escrow is changing. Uh, you know, possibly that's, that all depends on the mill levy, but the, the, the concern is real, and I appreciate that, but th there isn't anything in state law that allows us to, to let that value ride there, if you will. M Mr. President. Mr. Alderman. Uh, so, Mr. Hirschfeld, um, when, when Mr. Doletsky bought this property, um, did he have to allow you to um, enter the premises and inspect the property? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Holderman, he did not. 
and, and many people don't we appreciate those citizens that do it makes the property more accurate because uh, what we end up doing is we go by the property uh, and possibly with uh, Mr. Messel that was here earlier you know, if we don't get access to the house and we value the property from the street so we're standing at the curb there looking at the house have some familiarity with the neighborhood and you know in our newer neighborhoods a lot of the houses sell without basement finish but if it neighborhoods five or six years old people have been in there updating their basements putting finish on it and say 80 percent of the houses we get into have finished basements our estimate will likely carry uh, basement finish on that because the assumption is that it's following the trends of the neighborhood now that would then overvalue the property if it hadn't been finished and then being allowed access to the interior would then show us that no the basement hadn't been finished we're able to correct the card and remove that basement finish value and the reason I asked that question is the thing I'm worried about is um, I think if I asked Mr. Letsky, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if I asked him if he would allow you guys to do that again, he'd probably say no. Absolutely not. So, I mean, like, there is a disincentive to allow, I mean, for, for a new homeowner to, to allow the city assessor's office to do that if, if their valuation is going to go up close to, well, $90,000 in two years. And, you know... He could have saved seven percent by not allowing you guys into the into the premises. That's the thing I'm worried about is like, um, if 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 things like that continue to happen, do do we run into um, a situation where people see it as a disincentive to allow people into their property to get that card right? And I, I'm just thinking out loud right now. I I, I just I, I'm worried about that. And Mr. President, Commissioner Romer, that's a, a great uh, perspective, and I hadn't really thought of this before, but as often as we have uh, persons like Mr. Doletsky in here whose value went up, there are those whose value went down by a similar amount. They don't come in here and complain that their value went down. But, you know, maybe that's something we would track and, you know, and, and be able to put forward. Uh, you know, we, we saw 300 houses last year. Ten of them went up by 15 or 20 percent. Ten of them went down by... 15 or 20 percent most of them had no change just that way that that information would be out to the public and that there's as good a chance that the value goes down as there is that it goes up uh, where we're handcuffed a little bit is you know some of these neighborhoods we haven't been in 10 15 more years and if the house had been in poor condition the last time it was visited and after 15 years certainly has probably had some updating that property record card is going to see a, a big change because the conditions changed and the material changed maybe the the, uh, the quality of the house has changed with the newer materials and so it ends up with a large increase but by the same token a house that was you know newly remodeled the last time we were in there and it has since had 15 years of of uh, renters in it maybe then there's as good a chance that you know the condition and the would, would go down as well and so the, the incentive should be there for both parties, but I do understand your perspective. Mr. President. Ms. Frederick. Um, I mean, the reality is, is the market is, is, is driving these valuations. I mean, since COVID in 2020, new housing costs have went up about 15% a year. I mean, materials, labor, I mean, it's, you can't build a house what you could in 2020 anymore with with the cost well when those new sales come on in similar size houses they're probably costing a lot more than what this one is even valued at i understand there's some age on it and i, I guess i don't know the condition of the interior but i mean being in the building industry i mean from last year to this year we're seeing about a 17 percent increase in building costs just because of materials so that's going to trickle down at some point and that's why you're seeing existing home sales prices where there are i mean they just keep increasing every year if we don't catch it in a timely manner and we let these things slip out five to seven years then you're going to get an assessment that's eighty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars more at some point and then you're really going to wonder what happened so i mean i think we've been very good I, I what has it been two or three years now that we've pretty much capped our assessments is that it's been three three years 
So that three-year trend has been up and unfortunate. Now this is the year we're trying to catch up at to some point, so. Mr. President, um, so, so speaking to that, so yes, the market value has changed, but has the market value not changed over the last three to four years? My neighbors haven't seen a change in five years, whereas I saw a change last year of 7% to catch up to where my house should be. Just 12 months ago, that was changed to catch up. And I understand the it's changed COVID, the <coughs> building costs, this and that. The community of Dickinson is catching up with just 6% as a, probably an average across the board to catch up to where markets are, I increased seven on top of another six that's being applied to it. When speaking to Commissioner Oderman's point, I allowed the assessor's office to come into my home, which I re honestly regret doing. They should have stayed on the, in the driveway. That would have been much better, I feel. Um, and they got a very accurate idea of what my home is like just 12 months ago. And now I've seen, again, another 6% that the rest of the city has, but they didn't see the seven that caught me up before them. So Mr. Dolesky, our, I guess your request would be for? Um, I would request that my assessment go back down to my 2021 value of $602,100. And Mr. President, if I may, regarding that request, uh, that would need to be fulfilled through the abatement process. So I mean, Mr. Dolesky is free to file that abatement and bring that before, similar to some of the others that we have here with that request. And that would be the, the uh, method to to bring forward to us. Okay, would he do that at this abatement hearing? We would not do it at this abatement hearing. He'd have to file that with the county. Okay. And then we would uh, schedule that, you know, according to what state law is, but it would have to be filed at the county first. Okay. And we can assist Something you. you're willing to do? Yeah, file the abatement. I guess that's the way we have to take care of this, so. And we can assist you with that process too, if you need with the forms and that, so. Sure, sure. Okay. I, I, Mr. President, I guess the hearing here, so I have to go through abatement now. What's the point of this for vehicleization is meaning when you can't change the value here and I have to go through abatement to the county now? That was the 2021 value you were speaking to or this year's value? I want to return to my, you, you've issued me a oh, 2022 this, this, value of 640000 I, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. I thought I you want to return to my previous value of 602,000, which was my property value, that was increased to seven by seven percent for 2021. I'm not looking to recoup back down to 2020 value. I want to return to my 2021 value. So, if I understand, just to make sure I'm clear with you, you want to remove the 10 percent to I want to uh, remove increase the improvements that the rest of the city had removed from yours then. Correct. Okay. Yep. So that would be the six percent that was tacked on this year. Correct. Okay. Do you ever heard the request from Mr. Duletsky? I guess then I would look if anyone is willing to bring that to a motion uh, for that request or deny the request. Hearing no, Mr. Hirschfeld, have we had requests like this before in the past? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Oderman, we have uh, similar requests where the, the property owner didn't feel like the, the increase was justified, and so th this wouldn't be the first time that somebody's come to the podium and, and asked for a decrease in property. Uh, my big concern would be with this property specifically this year would be that this increase was done across the board to 7,000 properties. 
and so to so you're saying that to request the seven percent be be abated would be better well that, that, <laughs> that wouldn't have, wouldn't change this year's value for him so right. if he was successful in the abatement of the 2021 valuation it would reduce that value for 21 but would relieve would re leave the 2022 value remaining Any further questions? Mr. Delitzky, it seems like there is no motion to to uh, to hear your your grievance, so I guess then my suggestion would be to go through the abatement process. Is there something else you're willing to I don't think it's I don't think twenty twenty one is what the value is today, unfortunately. I mean, is there somewhere in between there that we can agree on or you and Mr. Hirschfield can work out? But, I mean, I, I, I just, I mean, obviously, I think 21 was fair, but I think your house has gone up since 21. Maybe it hasn't gone up $40,000, but it's gone up something. Okay. Uh, Mr. President and Commissioner Frederick, um, so I would not disagree with your statement that my property value has not increased um, but also the value of my home for what it would sell for isn't also the benchmark of what the assessor's office uses it for if I sell my house for a million dollars because somebody's willing to pay a million dollars for it that's not the benchmark that the assessor's office is ultimately using if they wanted to use that as a benchmark they would use my purchase price as my home value and they that's not what they chose to do so i'm not denying that my house hasn't increased the uh, you know housing market hasn't increased i'm not disagreeing with that what i'm disagreeing with is my house was already given a assessment increase last year and now i'm tacked on another assessment for the increase that i already saw the whole city already saw but they're getting it now and i'm getting a double. And I, I would also say that there's, I've looked at a lot of different properties that sold around the same time as my, as my home that were purchased. And I'm kind of, um, I, I thought more people would care about that. I think people are just apathetic and don't feel that this is, you know, they're going to get a change. I almost didn't show up because I honestly felt this was going to go nowhere. Um, but at the same time, this as a regular person as you guys as my five peers also have to see that this maybe isn't a just process um, and I don't want to say it's not fair because my house has increased but when somebody just came in that's a professionally evaluated it you know looked at it assessed it 12 months ago um, that's that's got to hold some water as far as what the value of the house is the other other houses haven't seen changes in six five six years five years four years to account for that change in the housing market that you talk about mine's seen 13 in two years two different assessment increases so i've caught up and now i'm catching up even more so if it would have uh, in 21 if it would have came in what exactly what you paid for it you wouldn't have had an issue in 21 then um so what i paid for the home it was a for sale by owner um there's deal there's a recorded sale on here. there's a recorded sale um so and part of that was for sale by owner. Um, not everything in that sale included just the dwelling and property. Um, I also purchased, uh, there was other things included, furniture, hot tub, um, different belongings that came with the home that are part of the purchase agreement. Um, so my, you know, the sale that, on uh, that sale price is actually less than what else we paid for the property or the dwelling itself. So I, I mean, I, I would be okay with a meeting in the middle, um, 620000 to account for some of the changes that I've done to the property as well as um, some change in market value. But I feel like a 6% on top of already a 7 um, is excessive and, I guess, 
I don't want to say unfair, but kind of unreasonable to to me as a new homeowner just 12 months ago. Mr. Hirschfield, thoughts? Yeah, Mr. President, Commissioner Frederick, uh, and having spoke with Mr. Deletsky before, uh, I think he and I share a, a similar concern here in that he, he's feeling singled out in his neighborhood that his values up to date and his neighbors are not. And that's a process of his neighborhood not having been through the revaluation process yet, which is forthcoming, but that's not necessarily soothing if you're the one who's caught up and your neighbors are not. So I understand that, that sentiment. I don't have a good answer to that because our staff is working as quickly as we can to complete the revaluation process. This is something that we've spoke about between the commission and myself, you know, in the past around staffing concerns and all of that. Part of that comes on uh, being responsible with the public's money and how much money do you want to spend in order to catch up, which sometimes exceeds the benefit. So that there, it, it's a big moving organism, if you will, and you're all aware of that as well. So I, I don't want to tell Mr. Deletsky, you know, tough, it's what it is, although that's what, you know, has been going on that, that the sales are the ones that we, we get to, right, wrong, or indifferent. We have to have accurate sales. If we don't have accurate sales, then there's no reliability in anything that we've completed. So I, I don't want to discount and discard what we've done with the sale. The answer would be making sure that we can complete the process in a six to seven year time frame uh, consistently. That would be, be my answer and in, in where I'd like to end up in, uh, initially or uh, uh, at, at the end of this is to, to be able to complete this process every six or seven years so we don't get as far out of whack, if you will, you know, where our car just stays more accurate throughout the process. Well, my, my concern here is that Mr. Deletsky did what I think is the right thing. He let you guys enter his, his home and it discourages um, him from doing that the next time. <laughs> and I, I mean, I am... I'm apt to meet in the middle because he did do the right thing here. Um, and, and I'd make the 620 motion. Since there is a motion on the table, I will abstain. Uh, Mr. Vice President, if you will take control of this motion. Sure. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to reduce his value to 620000 Any further discussion? Um... I'm comfortable with that number. It's a number that kind of came to m in my head. That's why, instead of asking him to leave and not, you know, I I, I think we're going to see probably more of these even as the years go by, just with the market the way it's going to be. But I mean, I'm, I think I'm fairly comfortable with the six hundred twenty thousand dollar value. If everybody else is so. So I have one question, Joe. Um, how often do we typically review each property card so that, you know, this doesn't become a systemic issue that it is, you know, all the neighbors are in the same, same boat. And so how often is that today and what is our goal? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Sobluck, I'm almost embarrassed to answer this question. Uh, some neighborhoods we've been in in the last two or three years the current revaluation process that we targeted to be a six or seven year project uh, started 10 years ago and we have houses that haven't been done since Vanguard uh, became our, our vendor in, 2020, in, in 2000, I'm sorry. So there are some properties we haven't been in in 20, 21 years. And so we're trying to get to those properties. Mr. Deleski's neighborhood is gonna be one of those where those properties are built prior to 1999, but subsequent to this boom where the staff has been into the new construction and we're, we're trying to get there but there's 7,000 houses out there and I have one appraiser who is right now training new staff as well so sure thank you for answering that honestly and so um, so if we do step back with this price then when there's a full assessment then the whole neighborhood may increase including Mr. Deletsky's house and it's it just that's how that will, so I'm kind of confused on how this will go forward from here if we would choose to change the price today. 
And, and I, Mr. President, Commissioner Sobolek, I'm very glad you asked that because I was getting ready to broach this exact subject with you. Uh, I don't necessarily have a concern with the, the change to the $620,000 number for all intents and purposes. It, it's as accurate as anything else out there, especially with mass appraisal. Uh, the tax implication to the city and to the rest of the jurisdiction is going to be minimal, so no huge concern. But going through the <clears throat> board of equalization process like this, you choose to make a change to this property for one year because it's a decrease to his value, but there's not a correction to his property record card. There isn't an inaccuracy that's been identified to the card that we could correct. So next year, that this review would go off and next year's value would become the value. And it may remain at 643 or 648. If the market goes up 10%, it might be 700,000 at that point. And then Mr. Dulesky will be here again. So because of the law that North Dakota has and what we're required to follow, this, this isn't something that will sit there that until we get to his neighborhood. It'll be something he'll have to come in annually and ask for. Well, well I mean, I don't know if that's the argument that Mr. Galetsky's making. I think he's, he's saying that his has gone up 13% in two years and his neighbors are going up 6% this year. I think that's the argument he's making is that like he's seen a significant increase that his neighbors have not seen. Am I, am I misconstruing your argument there? Uh, correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think that's where I'm at with it yeah. too. If, we, if he doesn't let him in, the, the first 6% doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the neighborhood hasn't changed, so it would have just been this first year. That, that's why I'm willing to make some compromise here. So. And Mr. President and Commissioners, in addition, I did make a call last year after they were in my home to discuss the value. And they said when they came back and did a neighborhood assessment or assessments were, additional assessments came about, my card would minimally change. Well, taking that for what it was worth, 12 months later, I see an additional 6% tacked on after having the conversation. There would be minimal, which I get this is a blanket, a blanket increase for the entire city and not a review of the neighborhood. But at the same time, I saw the seven and now I'm seeing six. Yeah. And, and like I've said, I think the 21 value is correct compared yep. to the sale I, that's I recorded. Um, but again, if you wouldn't have opened the door for us, it would have held at zero like the rest of the, yep. the, the city did. So that, well, that's and, and Mr. President, Commissioner Fredericks, I already interrupted you there if I did. No, no problem. Just, just one comment to that is that may not be accurate. It may be. But if from the, the curb there had been something that my appraiser may have noticed that it may have led to an even larger increase, at which point when Mr. Dileski lets us in, there would, be, would have been a decrease from that point. It, it, it's hard to yeah, play that I'm, game. We right. certainly appreciate the opportunity to get in. That makes us most accurate. But it, it could have went either way with that. Yeah, and I, and I understand that. I mean, if there was improvements that you can see from the street, that's that would have affected it also. That would have made a difference. But um, with that, is there any more discussion? We have a motion and a second on the floor. So I think we have a motion by Mr. Oderman and a second by Ms. Walla. Hearing no further discussion, we will take a vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Ms. Sobolek? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to come forward during this Board of Equalization time? Has anyone called in? 701-456-706. Anyone from the public? I will temporarily close the Board of Equalization in case somebody does come in at a later period after we'll move to the abatement hearing. Uh, Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. I uh, do want to remind you that I believe we do have a gentleman on, on the phone call there, so as long as that phone's up so that he could get in when it's his turn to speak. I think he's up. Uh, be, uh, that's Mr. Tibbles there, I think. We see uh, it'll be Mr. Stafford that should be on the phone. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to be, before I get into my, my PowerPoint here, 
and some of us the same as some. There will be some new slides, especially with Mr. Olderman's request. But I wanted to look at a little more holistic approach and explain a little bit more about the assessment. And I won't take a lot of time here, but th there's the, the uh, informal process which we're doing today. The City Board of Equalization starts the informal process. It can then go to the county for the County Board of Equalization and then the State Board of Equalization is heard in, in August. Uh, the property owner has an opportunity to each one of these steps to participate in the informal process and then if aggrieved throughout that process they still have the opportunity to uh, join in on the in the formal process which is the abatement which is heard at the city level the county level and then can go on into the district and Supreme Court if necessary and so when we the assessing when I say we the assessing office completes our evaluation we're following state law state tax guidelines and uh, gave to you guidelines 24 through 26 there as some of the, the, the work that we have to follow. And considering the income approach, uh, that means using the GIM. And that just very simply helps us through the income process, less time consuming, uh, maybe a little bit uh, less accurate if you will, maybe not, but certainly there, there's less data taken into account. And that's prepared then for for the informal process. Uh, Vanguard, when they did, uh, gave us a recommendation in 2019, they did use a cap rate study. Uh, there was a limited number of participants. These uh, three properties that we're hearing today chose not to participate through the informal process. So their income information was not included in the, in the analysis that Vanguard put on. And now we get to the, the, the formal process and they're upset that the outcome doesn't more reflect what they think it should based on their own income. And state law says you use in the information that you have and is that accurate or not? And you know, I, I don't believe it uh, resulted in any errors in invalid valuation and equitability. You know, it wasn't arbitrary, capricious or unreasonable. So yes, Vanguard gave us a, uh, an opinion of value that I had a strong amount of faith in that I can through the uh, gross income multiplier show that it's supportable and and finally to Mr. Oderman's question is what did the actual sales ratios look like and that's what I'm going to show to you here today Thing go to sleep here. Right. There we go. And so the first three slides, there's no change to the slides, I'm just demonstrating how the, the gross income multiplier looks like. Uh, I fully expected that we would have had apartment owners in here about the 2022 valuation just because of the increase to that and my response to that in case anybody's on the phone watching this still to, to, to uh, call in is that the value changed a lot of the incomes didn't surprisingly with with the uh, with the sales prices increasing and the answer to that is then the multiplier changed and so we get to this slide here and ignore the blacked out part but going from 2015, 16, 17 into 2018, we're looking at these apartment sales and I'm assuming that the, the uh, hotels would have resembled this if we'd had sales, but our sales are all above 100%. So, you know, that, that's showing over assessment to the apartments. I recommended to the board here that we have Vanguard do a market revaluation to try and see if there's any economic obsolescence that should be applied or anything else that we were maybe missing that would assist us in, in a getting ahead of the, the decrease, if you will. And so that was done. Uh, we hired Vanguard to do that. We've been with them for 20 years. They've been in business since 1968, have 315 clients in seven states throughout the Midwest. I mean, these guys know what they're doing. I have a strong amount of confidence in them and I, I wish my board to have confidence in them as well. 
they've since uh, they took us on in, in 1999 as a second client, they just about uh, are in every jurisdiction in North Dakota now, and like I say, the, most of the jurisdictions, all the jurisdictions that I talk to when we get together for our assessment meetings are very happy with the work that Van de Garde is doing, so I want to uh, bring that confidence onto to the board here and to the applicants as well. So starting with the, the Dickinson homestay, the true and full value of the property uh, for 2019 was $3,523,900. That's with an improvement value of $2,295,900, which decreased 70% from the year before, and a land value of $1,228,000, which has not changed per uh, Vanguard's uh, recommendation. Uh, the land should re retain the value it had through the uh, extraction method. The abatement uh, value, the, the value that was placed on the application for abatement was for $1,230,000, or roughly the value of the land. Uh, the improvement value they have is 802000 with a land value of 428000 Now, to date, I haven't gotten any information regarding any land sales that support that, sale, that value or any other sales. Uh, Mr. Stafford, if he's on, will come on and comment that their value is based off of the income, but I, I'd really like to see the sales that would have supported a land value of this to, to get to this valuation. Uh, I, I did the math on this, not that I necessarily had the time, but I thought it was very important. To date, uh, the property owners have 30 months from the Board of Equalization hearing that we're doing today to file an abatement uh, for, for, a, for a property taxes. And that's two years from the date it would become delinquent. Uh, and, and since that, they've had additional time from November 1 to this date to, to get that information. So 36 months to, to provide us with their, app, with, with their accurate valuation. Our office, and this year more than most, I, I want to stress upon the board, I want to stress upon the city about the thanks I have for my staff that we value 10,000 parcels and we do it annually in a maximum of 73 days. And so there's a little bit of discrepancy about the amount of time that an individual property owner has to get his accurate data versus the amount of time that we have to complete our assessment process. And I think we do a pretty good job of it. And we'll switch to that next slide. Here's the assessments. The, the lower red one there is the true and full value based on cost approach, uh, depreciation set by the market. And we've got some weighted numbers at, of the top two on what the income approach uh, based upon the income supplied by the property owner would, would indicate. All of those exceed what the abatement request is. And I want to point out specifically the, the shorter blue lines and the, that orange line. Those reflect 2019 only. And in 2019, the income approach exceeds all the other approaches to value. So the income was picking up through, through 2018 gain a little steam. Of course, we ran into COVID. That's another story, but for right now, we're worried about 2019. Uh, I also wanted to point out as a side note that this property had been abated four straight years from 16 to 19. The 2018 valuation, the income was 24% lower than in 20 for the 2019 valuation. However, the abatement request was 60% higher for the 18 abatement than the, than the 19 abatement. That didn't occur to me until late today, and I didn't get a chance to talk to Mr. Stafford, but maybe as part of what he talks to us about here today, he can explain the significant drop in their abatement request. And then to Mr. Oderman's question before he had to leave, uh, the last meeting, what did the sales look like? 
Uh, with what Vanguard returned to us, the two sales that we've had both occurred in 19, our, our hotel sales, their median was 100%. So they were spot on. I mean, two, two sales isn't a lot, but with these two sales, they were 100%. I mean, that's exactly where we wanted Vanguard to put us, and that's where they put us. Uh, the homestay uh, application for abatement would suggest that they'd have been out of tolerance 286%. And I just don't see that with the, the two sales that we've got here. Uh, with that, I'll uh, rest for a moment here and uh, accept any questions that the commissioners might have. Mr. President. Mr. Otterman. 100.5% is pretty dang good. I would say I have full and complete confidence in Vanguard's valuations if that's the number they hit. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Hirschfeld? Thank you, Mr. Hirschfeld, for that inf information. Mr. Stafford is with us. who are also on the line that tried to speak up when uh, you invited other members of the public to uh, speak up about equalization. And I don't think that audio went through. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about homestay if that's, we want to keep with, uh, since that's the agenda item that we started with Joe, but there are other people who wanted to speak to equalization itself. Um, and I didn't want them to get missed. Uh, if um, we're wanting to move ahead with the Dickinson Homes stay, uh, I've heard what Joe has to say. Um, and uh, I think one of you had to leave uh, the uh, meeting on January 31st uh, uh, before I got to uh, present my case. Uh, so for some of you, this might be a little repetitive, and I apologize. But I was uh, able to watch the meeting. When we so. had our hearing on January 31st, I outlined uh, my reasoning for uh, the value that uh, the taxpayer has requested, um, and I tied it into Vanguard's analysis. Uh, and I'll do that again today. Uh, when we uh, broke on the 31st, uh, it was because the assessor had asked the board for more time to obtain more information. And some of that information has been tracked down, but some of the uh, most troubling aspects of Vanguard's analysis uh, have not been addressed. And I think that um, it bears uh, serious consideration uh, because I've, I've followed the outline that Vanguard laid out and I've come to a very different number than Mr. Hirschfeld's office. Uh, again, we're here on an abatement, so the question is true and full value, not whether Mr. Hirschfeld did his job right or, or whether the model is good or Vanguard is good, uh, because with every model, uh, even the most perfect model, you're going to get outliers. Uh, and so this is a, a question not of is the model good, the question is, is the homestay valued at true and full value? Uh, the other thing I want to mention from the outset is that uh, while the application for abatement uh, asked for a reduction to 1.23 million, um, I always lowball what's on the application because that sets the floor for what we can request from the board. When we uh, sat down and looked at the number at numbers and did our analysis, uh, we're asking for a reduction uh, to um, uh, $1,810,000. Uh, so significantly up from the 1.2, still pretty far down from the 3.5-ish where it's assessed. Uh, but what we're asking for today is a reduction to $1.81 million, uh, which works out, by the way, to just about um, – uh, 28,300 a room, approximately. Uh, 
Now, in your packet uh, that Mr. Hirschfeld provided, uh, you should all have a copy of the letter from Vanguard. Uh, that uh, it's a 10 page letter that Vanguard sent to Mr. Hirschfeld and it goes through how Vanguard approached every type of property. And the hotel section starts on page seven. Uh, the hotel section starts by listing two sales and four listings of hotels uh, in Dickinson that uh, Vanguard started their sales approach analysis by looking at this. Uh, so the two sales uh, were for about 17 grand a unit and about 8,300 a unit. Uh, now, Mr. Hirschfeld and I would both agree that those sales are inferior to the homestay, uh, but we've also got four other listings here, uh, which range from about uh, 14,000. Sorry about that. I'm just waiting until the feedback went away. Um, so with these six sales and listings, am I still uh, on the line, by the way? Yes, you are, sir. I didn't get dropped. Okay, just making sure I didn't get dropped. Uh, so like I said, we're asking for about uh, 28 three per room, which is the high end of the listings. Uh, 29 five is what the, uh, the red roof was, was listed at. And again, that's those four listings, obviously you would prefer to have an actual sale to a listing. Uh, but those listings represent some meaningful market data. That's what the seller is hoping that a buyer will buy it for. Uh, a buyer is likely to negotiate that down, but it's still a, you know, nobody wants to uh, price themselves so high that, that a buyer wouldn't go for it. Uh, so this is meaningful market data, and uh, these six sales, all or six sales and listings together, um, average out to about uh, sixteen thousand three fifty a key. Uh, and again, we're asking for about twenty eight thousand three hundred a key, which is right towards the very high end of the sales and listing evidence that. Um, Vanguard put together. Now, the primary uh, analysis that uh, Homestay put together uh, for its analysis of value was the income approach. Um, now, I only have access to my own client's data, the, the income and expenses that it faced uh, and we gave the assessor's office five years worth of that data, three years before the assessment date and two years after. Um, if we can't have a huge sampling in terms of getting the data from income data from other hotels, because our competitors don't like to share that with us, we at least have uh, a good look at a window over a five year span of what this hotel brings in. And if you look at the, uh, the income analysis that we put together, we uh, put together the averages for the income based on 2018 through 2020, 2016 through 2020, and then 2016 through 2018, which is just the three years before the assessment. All of those landed in a really tight range between 27.5 per key and 28.7 per key. And we're hitting right in the middle there at 28,300 per key is where we're asking for. Uh, when we did this uh, income approach, uh, we chose a capitalization rate of a little more than 8%. We loaded it with the effective tax rate and came up with a, a loaded capitalization rate of 9.5%. Compare that to what Vanguard did. Vanguard on page seven of its letter says that the income data uh, that was, it was able to gather from the city of Dickinson uh, indicated a cap rate of 10%. Uh, now, the higher the cap rate, the lower the value. It's an inverse relationship. So I'm using a lower cap rate and therefore deriving a higher value than I would be if I had used Vanguard's number straight out of the box. But I'm half a percent lower than Vanguard. Um, and that's... 
they were going 10% base uh, and and 11.55% loaded. I'm at 9.5% loaded. I've got the lowest cap rate in the room, the most conservative cap rate, um, resulting in the highest value between Vanguard, the other properties. I'm using the lowest cap rate. When you look on page eight of this Vanguard letter, they also looked at the income data that I don't have access to. As the income data for other hotels. And uh, they've got three uh, data points uh, that they list on page eight of their letter uh, that result in an income value per unit of uh, ranging from 5,400 up to 53,570 per key. Uh, the average of those three is 25,600 roughly. So again, we're right in the neighborhood and a little bit higher with asking for 28.3 per key. Uh, something that, and this is the this is the big part that I had questions about uh, back in January, and that the assessor's office um, hasn't been able to. Uh, answer the question for uh, the Vanguard letter says that uh, you know it lists these three and then it says uh, just above that table it should also be noted that additional income and expense statements statements plural were submitted that are not included on those this table those statements indicated a negative net operating income so they were excluded for the table now here's the problem. So they ignored at least two statements out of at least a universe of five that were submitted. Now maybe they ignored three out of a universe of six or 10 out of a universe of 13. All we know is that they used three and ignored any statement that didn't show the hotel being profitable. As Joe said, when, when uh, you guys were talking about residential properties, you guys are always looking for the median. Uh, when you're looking to develop the income analysis for the hotel market in Dickinson, you don't want to just be looking at the hotels that are making a profit. You want to look at all the hotels. And if there's a reason not to consider a particular income and expense statement, like if you know that they're in bankruptcy or something, then that's a reason to ignore it. But to just ignore it because it's low is to get a distorted look at the market. There are a certain number of people who are willing to come to Dickinson in a given month, stay a given span of time, and pay a certain amount for a room. You average all that out to get to the right number. And they ignored, Vanguard ignored at least 40% of the data that was in front of it because that was the 40% that wasn't uh, beneficial to the assessor. And uh, I'll admit to a little bit of cynicism here. And this is something Joe and I talked about a, a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Joe has asked, uh, and sorry, I say Joe, I mean Mr. Hirschfeld. We talk on the phone enough that I use first name, even though in this context I, I should be more formal, so I apologize. Um, but it's something Mr. Hirschfeld and I have discussed. Um, uh, you know, the assessor's office sends out these questionnaires to all the hotels. Um, Homestay didn't respond. Now, I wasn't involved in that decision not to respond. I don't know if that request got lost in the mail, thrown away by a desk clerk, or if it went up to the highest levels of management and they spent a week debating whether or not to answer it. I have no idea. But I will tell you that whenever a client comes to me and asks, hey, an assessor sent me this questionnaire. Should I, should I respond? I say no, because the cynicism I've got born of experience is that if it's bad for the taxpayer, they'll use it. And if it's good for the taxpayer, they'll ignore it. Page eight of this Vanguard letter justifies my cynicism. They ignored market data in order to inflate the income value. Even so, what I'm asking for in terms of a value per room is higher than the average of these three successful hotels. 
It's, it's not just higher than the median. We don't know where the median is because Vanguard decided to ignore at least 40% of the evidence in front of it and maybe more. So we don't know the true median. That's what Joe asked for more time to track down. That's what Mr. Hirschfeld asked for more time to track down. And I haven't heard anything from the assessor's office that answers the question why Vanguard would ignore those statements. Like I said, if they, if they had an articulable reason, they were in bankruptcy, if they, if they were in the middle of a, of a distressed sale or something like that, then that, that would be an articulable reason to ignore that market data. But as it is, it's just a distortion of the market. Even so, the request that I'm making for a valuation of 1.81 million, and that's 20, uh, 28, three a key, sorry, uh, yeah, 28, 300 per key. Uh, it's in line with the top end of the sales and the listing information that Vanguard prepared. It's in line with the average of the income information that Vanguard relied upon even though it ignored several statements that we have no idea why they ignored it or if they had a, a reasonable reason for doing so. And I used a lower cap rate than Vanguard did. I think the request for a reduction to 1.81 million is highly supportable. Um, I've asked the, the city to, uh, to adopt that reduction on January 31st. Uh, Mr. Hirschfeld asked for more time. And some of what Mr. Hirschfeld and I discussed in the interim uh, resolved some of the issues about, like, the, 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 multi, the grade multiplier and stuff. I'm, uh, there are some arguments that I made on January 31st that I'm not making today because we were able to talk through some of the outstanding issues and some of, some of the outstanding questions. But the question that remains in my mind is why Vanguard intentionally distorted, uh, well, not in, intentionally is the wrong word, but selectively applied the data in such a way that inflates the income approach and in such a way that um, it's not explained why their analysis is reliable. It's not explained why it was appropriate for them to ignore uh, at least two out of five uh, income statements that were submitted to it. So, uh, and, and again, that's the bit that, despite the, the request for more time, never heard a thing from Vanguard, never heard a thing from the assessor's office to explain that. Uh, so with that, I think my request for 1.81 million is reasonable. It's in line with the sales and income information that Vanguard put in the letter to the city. Um, I think we're right on the nose with our analysis. Uh, and I would ask for the, uh, the board to uh, grant an abatement, uh, lowering the value to $1.81 million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. Mr. Hirschfeld, do you have any comments? Uh, before Mr. Hirschfeld, commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Stafford? There are no questions for you, Mr. Stafford. Um, Mr. Hirschfeld. Oh, thank you, Mr. President, commissioners. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Stafford for the conversations we've had the past several weeks here. Had good discussion, had uh, shared some information. And, uh, you know, t to piggyback on some comments earlier, I think his, his concerns, which, remember, some valid concerns he has, would have been much more persuasive at this Board of Equalization meeting in 2019. But uh, as, bar, as far as being persuaded, I'm gonna let the work of Vanguard there that's on the board speak for itself. If that median would have been 180, 200%, by all means, you know, Mr. Stafford's got a good point. But when it falls in at 100, with, with, with those two sales, I mean, that's exactly where we wanna be. I, I, I think the, 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 the value, the, the work that Vanguard did, what we've been able to, uh, to support there speaks for itself. I mean, if a picture's a thousand words, that one speaks 10,000 words to me. I mean, I'm all in confident with, with uh, what we have from Vanguard. Mr. President. Uh, any uh, questions for Mr. Hirschfeld from commissioners? Mr. Oderman? Yeah, uh, Mr. Hirschfeld, can you speak, the two, to, speak to the 286% then? Uh, certainly, uh, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Oderman, that is 
uh, that percentage would be the, the, the difference between the assessed value and the value that's on the abatement request. So if the abatement request was the actual sales price, which it's not, it, it's all theories, what we're doing here, that's why we're having these discussions. That 286%, that's how far off our valuation would have been from that sale price if the abatement value would have been a sale price. Mr. Hirschfield, um, can you explain, you know, we talk about averages and stuff. Um, why would they omit financial statements that, uh, that were provided? And I mean, if we've got some that are good and some that are bad, why, why wouldn't we take the, the whole pile into consideration? And Mr. President, Commissioner Frederick, that, that, that's a good question. I haven't spoke to uh, Mr. Ayler who did this for Vanguard to ask him why he did not include those. Uh, Mr. Stafford came up with several good reasons why they might have been omitted. Uh, there's data that comes across my desk, much like what Mr. Stafford already addressed, why it was omitted. Uh, certainly if you're looking at negative incomes, maybe there's something about the expenses as they re were reported that were way out of line with what everybody else was doing and so they weren't reliable and they were set to the side. Probably the information still weighed on the mind of, in fact, I know it did because we spent several hours, Mr. Ayler and I, discussing apartments themselves and whether that 70% was going to be enough. And so, I mean, much like what our discussion is here today, because we didn't have these two sales to rely upon when, when this, uh, uh, this adjust, these adjustments were made for the 19 Board of Equalization. So the exact reasons why, I don't know, but certainly Mr. Stafford addressed several of them. I could come up with a, you know, a few more possibilities why I might have excluded them, but certainly the fact that they were showing negative, which if you put a rate on, would suggest that we would have to value back or give monies back to those property owners, which we certainly can't do, as there's always some intrinsic value in the land. And it, it, at that point, the highest and best use, which is part of our analysis, would be that those improvements should be raised, you know, uh, removed from the from the property, and it would be best suited as vacant land. Do you agree by omitting them and not putting in the report why they were omitted as a reason? It makes it look like they were left out to show the value higher. On I mean, that I mean that's why I'm, I mean, if he omitted him for a reason, then it should have been in the report why they were not in there. And that's something I can certainly address that. You know, next time he does that, whether it's for our jurisdiction or somebody else's, it would be helpful for the readers three years down the road. I don't recall if that was addressed at the Board of Equalization meeting three years ago or not. But, I mean, we could go back and watch that. But it, certainly I, I agree it would be helpful to know for a hearing like this. But, th like I said, the end result, looking at the results on the board there, if it would have been 200% instead of 100% as our median, it would carry much more validity. The fact that we came in with those models as close to 100 as we did suggests that Vanguard was right to exclude those. Any other questions for Mr. Hirschfeld? The request on the table by Mr. Stafford, who represents Homestay, is the owner's request. Initial request was 1.23 million, and the, Mr. Stafford said that has been adjusted to 1.81 million, so 1,810,000, um, roughly to his numbers, 28,300 um, per room. Uh, we currently have the true and true value on homestay at three million five hundred twenty three thousand nine hundred this board has we have three options we make no change to current and true value true and full valuation we change value to owner request or we change value to some other amount so I would look for a motion from the Commission I would move to accept the city assessor's office valuation. So your motion is to make no change to current true and full valuation. Correct. 
So I have a motion by Commissioner Oderman to make no change to the current true and full valuation. Second, Second by Commissioner Sobolok. Any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, we will vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mrs. Soblock? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Chair votes aye. We will forward this, Mr. Stafford, to the county with a recommendation to make no change to the current true and full valuation. Thank you, Commissioners. Do you know when that uh, county uh, meeting will be at this time, or is that uh, unknown to you? We're getting. First Tuesday in May, Mr. Stafford. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hirschfeld, the next the next property we'll be discussing is this the Jefferson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, that's I, I believe it is, and it's as good a one as any here. Let's skip that slide ahead. Yes, Jefferson Creek, sorry. Okay. So and this is an abatement for we have for 2018, I mean 2019, 2020, and 2021? That is correct. Okay. And so, Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, a slide again that you've seen before. This just uh, shows our gross income multipliers for apartment sales over the past several years. As I'll just kind of skate by those, uh, this graph that data that was just in the previous chart, uh, looking at Jefferson Apartments, with the gross income multiplier. The blue line there, trend line that you see is true and full. Uh, the orange line is income. And we show in 2019 those lines cross, stating that income is starting to come back and that uh, uh, becomes stronger and that the, the income approach is showing a higher valuation than what the, the true and full value was. Positive sign for our market. I'm glad to see that. Uh, similar to, to the homestay, this just shows in a bar format, the, the different approaches to value as well as the ones that are weighted. Uh, the green one at the top shows changes due to uh, abatement decisions over the past several years. And then the, the yellow bar there, owner's request, no change to this one since the prior meeting. Uh, Lincoln Apartments here showing the same, same information that Jefferson did. I'll just kind of skate by those. We can come back to them as need be. I want to get to this slide here. Uh, again, the information requested by Mr. Oderman. What did the sales look like? We saw the first half of this graph uh, earlier as it's, we used it to indicate that uh, we needed to do something, brought Vanguard in, and uh, their recommendation was to add 20% uh, obsolescence, economic obsolescence to the, to the improvements. So they were valued 80% of what the rest of commercial properties were and that did what we needed to along with stronger sales. It ended up getting the medians below that 100% threshold. In fact, we probably could have got along without making that downward adjustment in 19, but certainly did not know that the market was going to come back as strong as it did. And that median was 85%. And then continuing since we do have three abatements, that we've got an 80% uh, median for 2020. And then in 2021, a median of 84%, but we do have some, a larger variability in there. We've got two sales showing a really strong market. One sale just above 100%, it was 104. And then I wanna make note of that top sale because it looks like it's really far out of, uh, uh, out of line there, but it, it's a, a low value property and it's $12,000 higher than the assessed value. So I mean, if it would have sold for $12,000 more, it would have been within within the 100% threshold. So a very minor value difference with that property, just a, a, a small, uh, lower quality property. So it doesn't take much to throw the ratios off on it. But a, as you can see, where's that line at? But following that blue, there we go, that blue trend line, it just continues to go down and down and down like this. So we had to do something that was the, the increase that we did for the 2022 valuation, uh, adding that value back. And we'll skip ahead to that, oh, 
that would be this green one. So the 2020-2021 sales have a 95%, well that glows pretty nice there, 95% uh, median. So this year's values are spot on with what the rest of commercial is. I think we're at 94%. Uh, median for all the commercial apartments now are at 95% for the sales, but getting a little ahead of myself, apologize. We'll back up to this slide here. And this is uh, the same slide, not the same slide, but similar data to what you saw with the homestay. How did Vanguard's recommendation turn out here compared to the re abatement requests? And as you see, apartments as a whole, we've all but two of the 15 sales we've had were less than 100%. And as that line continues to show downward trend, they were, apartment sales are just getting stronger and stronger. So starting to be some hope, I guess, in the apartment owners community, willing to pay a little bit more as they expect that we're coming out of, out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic with strengthening oil prices. You know, some people are getting a little excited and paying a little more for apartments. So good, good things to see. But back to the, the abatement, uh, the abatement request for these also far outside of what the rest of the data is showing us and kind of leave that up for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hirschfeld. Any uh, questions for Mr. Hirschfeld from the commission? Hearing no questions, we'll move to Mr. Tibble. I think he is on video. Good afternoon, can you folks hear me? We can. All right, great, perfect. Well, again, David Tibbles from the Fredrickson and Byron firm in Fargo here, appreciate you, appreciate you having me back here again today. Um, I've got a few brief comments, um, really probably just about five, five minutes worth of comments here for you. I, I do wanna start off though, frankly, folks, with, um, with an apology, to be honest with you. Um, last time we spoke, I was incredibly short with you all. Um, I was, you know, to be honest with you, a little worried that we were going to make a decision without having had an opportunity to review all the information that the taxpayer had provided. Um, and I was really frustrated by that sort of thing, but frankly, that's no, that's no excuse <laughs> for my attitude that, that night. Um, so, so I hope, hope you can accept my apologies on, on that. Um, regardless, you know, as, as you folks had, had requested and, and, and certainly you're gracious enough to to table making a decision on those on those abatements. As you had requested, we provided some authority for the capitalization rates that we had used in our in our calculations. We provided that to Mr. Hirschfeld, I think about two or three days after after the meeting there, just within within that week. And then I understand just within about the last week or so, you've had redistributed to you, you know, all of the materials that the taxpayers had provided, um, you know, both at the time of um, of the abatement applications being filed, but then also some of the supplemental materials that we had provided, you know, in the weeks weeks after and, and through discussion through discussions with with Mr. Hirschfeld. Um, I hope that from reviewing that information, you take away that really, but for but for two data points in our calculation, and I'm happy to talk more about those if you have any questions. We're we're using the unadulterated financial performance numbers from, from these properties in our calculations. Um, you know, the two things that we're, we're not using, you know, just straight from the rent rolls from the financial statements are the capitalization rate. And as we had talked about last time, there's a little bit of an art in figuring out what that is. You can't just pull that from the financial statement. And then number two was, was what's an appropriate number to put in for reserves? We use a, we, a pretty standard $250 per, per unit number. Um, you know, that's, that's just a, um, just kind of a standard number that's, that's plugged in, plugged in there. But, but for the rest of the calculation, I mean, when we look at market rent, we look at other income, rental concessions, things like that, it's, it's stuff that we're pulling from, from the financial statements themselves. You know, I certainly understand why, why you might be skeptical, but, but to be completely honest with you, we're, we're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to hide the ball. Um, you know, I hope that that sort of thing has been conveyed you know, through our discussions with Mr. Mr. Hirschfeld, we're always happy to adjust those calculations. We're always open to additional information that's that's provided, and frankly, that's that's where we're coming from with that with that information. Now, I don't know that I need to 
really say much more about about our calculations. We talked, you know, I think for about an hour the last time we met um, regarding what we're doing with those numbers. If you have specific questions, I'm certainly happy to to answer them. But I want to make just sort of two general comments here, um, and then kind of leave you again with sort of, um, I guess, the request that I had had last time that we were here. You know, comment number one is. And I know it's kind of difficult here because we're talking both about equalization and we're talking about abatements and, and that sort of thing. But but keep in mind that again for for the you know the application, the action that's in front of you, the decision that's in front of you right now, the question is what is true and full value? A lot of the information that Mr. Hirschfeld provides is is really interesting for, for purposes of equalization, which of course is an important consideration for you. But but again, when we get down to it this application, um, the question before you is true and full value. I grant that the state of, you know, the state of state law in this perspective, we've got these two separate tracks of decision making that has to happen. I don't know that they reconcile all that well, but but them's the rules, and that's kind of what we're what we're dealing with there. So again, we're looking at what's that true and full value of the property for which the abatement application was provided. Point number two is I just I you know I I want to spend just a moment again kind of characterizing what it is that we're we're asking for here today. The value that's presented in the abatement application for each one of these properties for each year, it's it's the product of the income approach calculations that the taxpayer has prepared. We certainly stand behind those. Um, and, and like I've talked about before, really what they're doing is presenting to the extent that we can, a calculation based on property specific numbers, not, not a market survey approach, uh, but, but how exactly is this particular property performing? We think that that sort of thing is important. Um, but again, that's, that's what we're doing with that, with that calculation there. Now, to be honest with you, it's informative for me to be sitting here at an equalization meeting, right? Because I get to I get to see a side of Mr. Hirschfeld's job that I don't necessarily get to see, right? And he has a difficult one. It's not something that I can do. Um, you know, I, I I I agree, right? It's I I think it's you know it's awfully difficult, especially in this time of you know time of post COVID you know, workforce issues and that sort of thing. I mean, he and his team have to get their work done on an annual basis within just a few months. And, and, and that's not something that I, I can say that I can do. And, and that's just one reason why what we're doing here is not, we're not criticizing the work that Mr. Hirschfeld has done. We're not picking apart the calculation he's done. We're not picking apart the numbers that he's done. Instead, what we're hoping to do here is just provide again, a supplement um, to what he's doing, one that takes the property specific information and looks at that specifically, setting aside the you know the market based information as well. And that's why, you know, again, I guess, you know, at the end of the day, I think what I'm gonna leave you with is is the request from last time, which is I, I would hope that you would reconcile this information with with what he's done. I think we all know that, you know, again, particularly for commercial property owners, but anyone who's going to make a decision on um, on an investment property, they want to know specifically how that property had, had been performing. Market performance is certainly important information. It's useful, it's relevant, and it absolutely should be part of your decision making here. And so, you know, Mr. Hirschfeld's Vanguard's results, you know, largely take into account a a cost-based analysis. They take into account an income-based analysis based largely on market survey information. That's all useful, and that should be part of your decision making. But at the same time, a property-specific view, a focus on how these individual properties are performing, is is really not something that should be ignored. And we know that anyone who's going to going to consider an investment in one of these properties is going to want to know that that information. And so, I, you know, again, with with that, what I'm going to do here is just, you know, I'm going to share, well, I'm going to try to share my screen. We practiced this earlier. <laughs> um, but I'm going to leave you with this spreadsheet, which is, again, this is something that I pulled up the last time we spoke. I have tabs at the bottom here for each of the property, for, for each of the properties, for each of the tax years that are being 
um, that ab abatements are being are being sought. And and frankly, what I'm suggesting here, and these red numbers, I know you've got this, you've got printoffs of this spreadsheet in your packet. These red numbers here are things that, you know, you tell me a number and I can put it in there and I can kind of show how the calculation would, you know, would adjust in in real time. But but I think a way to go about this, a way to go about making a decision that's both uh, within the range of evidence and and considering of all of the evidence that's been been provided to you to date is to essentially weigh the approaches just like you know a number of appraisers that i've seen do on a regular basis what's the appropriate weighting i i don't know and and frankly i leave that leave that to you but but i think that to you know and, and, and to kind of piggyback a little bit off of what what mr stafford had had mentioned i think I think to ignore, simply ignore this property specific lens is is to ignore very important evidence that, that really ought to be considered. And, and, and we all know that anybody who would be investing in one of these properties would, would take that into account somewhat. That's not to say that it's controlling. That's not to say that it's it would be the the sole um, sole data point or the most significant one, but it but it is absolutely something that would go into you know, be taken into consideration there. And, and, and this spreadsheet is, is again, sort of meant to be a way to show you, you know, how, how that sort of weighting might, might influence sort of a reconciled value there. So with that, like I said, I, I wanted to be brief here. You know, you've heard, you've heard enough of my spiel about, you know, how we go about the calculations there. Um, if you have any particular questions about our calculation method, I'm always happy to answer those. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, hopefully, you know, um, if you have, you know, if you have some, some ideas as to maybe how to weight these different approaches here, I've got a couple just sort of, you know, fixed examples. And then we've got, um, you know, kind of individual percentages that we can play with as well. I can certainly plug these in and you can see, um, you know, in a way that the print off isn't going to show, I can show you how that would influence sort of an overall reconciled value. Thank you, Mr. Tibbles. Any questions, commissioners, comments? I see we're all doing a lot of math here, so. Again, before us, we have abatement request for Jefferson Creek Apartments for 2019-2020. In 2021, the values from the city assessor's office are the same for all three years. The request from the property owner, there are different requests. And uh, Mr. Hirschfeld had that in a slide that shows the variation. No, Mr. The, President. From the three different. Um, if I recall correctly, last year we had requests for these same, same. Uh, apartment complex is correct it's the same property I think, I think so yes and i think we had three years just like we have this year uh, well maybe maybe it wasn't three years but i, I, I know that the, at, you can, I, yeah, yes, you can I, look I know at the, the compromise one. that we came to was we met somewhere in the middle um between the true and full value and the income uh but our true and full value is lower than the income for all three of these requested years I think and so I, I guess I struggle with the abatement requests here based on the fact that our true and full value is lower than their income on all three of these given years. And in one year in particular, the, the, the 2021 owner request of $5.491 million for for Lincoln? Well, I, we're right now sorry, we're, we're, we're Jefferson. addressing. Jefferson, well, we're, sorry. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, sorry, this. sorry. Yeah. Um, the the, the 1.443 million, I mean, I mean, that's almost 3 million less than the true and full value that we have requested. Um, I'll say the exact same thing I said, you know, when we had this meeting a couple months ago. There's no way they're selling that property for that. And if they are, you'd have investors lined up down the down the block to make that offer. 
especially at this time. If I might, I mean, just just two points, two po points yep. on that. I mean, number Mr. one, let's, let's you know, keep in mind that for that one, we're, we're talking February 2021. So just keep that keep that in mind there, and 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 I think I think you're right. Maybe that's maybe that's not maybe that's not it. 1.4 isn't isn't the number there, um, but that 1.4 might go into consideration in, in sort of a an overall reconciled view of what the value of that property might be. And that's why again I you know I offer I offer the suggestion to do something that that a third party appraiser might do, which is to take these few different data points and reconcile them. Um, you know, very, very rarely. In fact, I can think of maybe just on on one occasion where I think there was a difference between two two approaches of something like fifty thousand dollars, right? I mean, very rarely are are the different approaches right right within a very precise uh, precise grouping there. And the the point is that you might have different you know different results from from each approach here. And and that's why again I'm I'm, I'm suggesting here that that's that's just one as I did last time. That's just one perspective on on value here. I, the twenty eighteen, we valued we had a abatement decision of four million. That's basically ninety thousand dollars a unit. Uh, ninety thousand dollars a unit works out to. Um, I just did the math. Um, four million fifty thousand. If I'm correct. So that's roughly what we valued them in 2018 and a little bit more in um, 2017, but we dropped our full and true value actually by the assessor's office down to 4.284 million. Um, but, but, but again, I'll go back to, yeah. I, I, I think those compromises we made there on those abatement requests was based on the fact that you saw a significant drop off in income between 2016 and 2017. Right. And we've seen increased income here the last three years, except for there, there was a drop off in, in, in 2021 between 20 and 21. Yeah. But uh, they, they, they have rebounded from, you know, that significant drop off and they're slowly growing their income again. Um, and, and I think we're a little bit more probably in, closer to the actual true true and fair value um, now than we were back in 2017. Any other comments or questions, commissioners? Again, as a board, we have, there are no further comments or questions. As a board, we have three options. We make no change to the current and true value, full, full valuation, uh, which is the recommendation of staff. Uh, we can change the value to owner request, or we can change the value to some other amount. And, uh, Mrs. Wenko, do we need to do these properties individually? Uh, Mr. President, commissioners, I would recommend you do so. Individually? Okay. Correct. So currently, we have a request from the representation for Jefferson Creek of $2,181,949. We have a valuation set by the city's assessor's office at 4284700 Mr. Tibbles has also made the comment that there is possibility um, to meet in between. Again, as a board, we have three options. Make no change, change value to owner request, or change value to some other amount. I would leave it to the commission for a motion. Mr. President. Mr. Oderman. I move to approve the true and full value uh, proposed by the assessment department This is for, for 2019. Okay, for this is for 2019 property. The PID is 1140-0700-0100. We have a motion to make no change. Second. 
The second by Commissioner Frederick. The initial motion was by Commissioner Oderman. Any further discussion? I just one comment. I don't think there's been a, a section of the commercial property in this city that has seen more benefit than probably the apartment market and trying to work with them to get them into a value that is reasonable and seems to be fair. So I think we've done a lot over the last few years to help these individuals out. And I mean, just looking at some of the true and full values from when these originally came on compared to where they are now and what the cost to build back then was, I, I, I think we've, uh, we've accommodated that area of the commercial market very well, so. Yeah, I would agree. Any further comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Mrs. Sobolek? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The next item would be the 2020 abatement request for Jefferson Creek. This is property 1140-0700-0100. The request from the owner's representation is $2,542,695. The assessed value is four million two hundred eighty four thousand seven hundred. Mr. President, I make a motion to accept the true and full value supplied by the assessing department and make no change. We have a motion to deny the request and make no change to the current true and full valuation for the property Jefferson Creek 2020 by Commissioner Frederick. Second. Second by Commissioner Sobolek. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mrs. Sobolak? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The next property uh, abatement request would be the, for the Jefferson Creek 2021. Again, property ID is 1140-0700-0100. The request for 2021 is $1,443,139. City assessed value is four million two hundred eighty-four thousand seven hundred. Mr. President, I make a motion to make no change to the assessor's recommendation. We have a motion by Commissioner Frederick to make no change to the current true and full valuation for the property for the period of twenty twenty one. Second. And a second by Commissioner Oderman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Mrs. Sobolek? Aye. Chair votes aye. We will move to the Lincoln Apartments. Mr. Hirschfeld? Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioners, uh, kind of already hit the highlights on the slideshow. Uh, Comments, uh, arguments would be the same as they were for Jefferson Creek from my standpoint. Recommendation would still be to make no change. Open to any uh, questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hirschfeld. Are there any questions from Mr. Hirschfeld on this Lincoln Apartments property? Hearing nothing from the commission, Mr. Tibbles? No, no comments, no additional comments from me other than, than, than what, you, what you heard me say already. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tibbles. Commissioners, any uh, comments, questions on Mr. Hirschfeld's presentation or Mr. Tibbles' earlier comments? Again, we have three separate requests for three separate years on the same property, 2019, 2020, and 2021. This is for the Lincoln Apartments. The property, the ID number is 8021 Zero two zero zero dash zero two zero zero. This time I would entertain any motions to accept, deny, or change to some other value. Our three possibilities.
Mr. President, I'd move, move to accept the true and full value for Lincoln, apartment, Lincoln Apartments uh, for 2019. We have a motion to, ex to make no change to no the change. current and true valuations for the time period of 2019 to the Lincoln Apartments, property ID 8021-0200-0200. By Commissioner Oderman. Second. Second by Ms. Walla. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mrs. Sobolek? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Our next item up is for the 2020 period, Lincoln Apartments. We have a request by ownership, representation, of nine million two hundred ninety eight thousand seven hundred thirty six we have a full and true value of seventeen million two hundred seventy six thousand one hundred dollars mr president i make a motion to accept the true and full value that is being reported by the assessing department and make no change we have a motion by Commissioner Frederick to make no change to the current true and full valuation for the time period 2020 of the Lincoln Apartments, ID 8021-0200-0200. Second. Second by Commissioner Sobolek. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Frederick. Aye. Mrs. Sobolek. Aye. Ms. Walla. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Our next item up is, again, the Lincoln Apartments for the time period of 2021. The request by ownership representation is $5,491,318. The city's assessor's value on this property is $17,276,100 for the time period, again, of 2021. I'd move to approve the true and full value. Up as a... Um, presented by the city. We have a motion by Commissioner Sobolek to make no change to the current and true and full valuation of the Lincoln Apartments. Second. With a second by Commissioner Walla. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mrs. Sobolek? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Tibbles. The second Tuesday of May is the Stark County Tuesday. hearing. Yep. All right. First okay, perfect. Thanks so much, folks. Can I see I'm the, I'm the only other person on the video here, so no, uh, no worries. It's no worries. First Tuesday, May 5th. Is it first Tuesday or second? First Tuesday, Mr. Tibbles. Okay, great. Perfect. Perfect. Thank she, you. Uh, the county represent, uh, rep representative said they will send notification to you. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. No, I appreciate the confirmation. Yep. All right. Thanks, folks. Take yep. care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we have somebody online. Individual, uh, individual that's online. On the phone. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is Ben Hyde with Honda. You are the only participant in the conference. Ben, ben Hyde with Honda Development. Okay. And uh, which yeah, part? My, my last name is spelled India Delta. And I'm calling you from uh, Harbor Springs, Michigan. Good evening. Good evening. You, uh, you, uh, which properties are you speaking to? I am calling about parcel number 1631 And I'm not sure if I'm speaking up at the right point of the meeting, so if I'm not, please forgive me. Is that what we just, is Lincoln Park different than Lincoln? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Commissioners. Lincoln Park Apartments, yes. The mm -hmm. owner name is Dickinson Lincoln Park Apartments, LLC. This is a different uh, apartment. The other ones were named uh, Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln Apartments. These are located over off of 18th okay. uh, by Lincoln Street. Is, is is this this is not for an abatement this is for this, this is not this will be part of the board of equalization okay so you're you're calling for the board of equalization am i correct that's correct okay okay oh, we'll listen to your concerns sure thank you for letting me join tonight before i get started um mr Hirschfeld, i'm having trouble hearing you on the line i seem to be getting 
commissioner's okay, but um, I don't know. I don't know what's causing that, but just a heads up. Um, Mr. President, commissioners, Mr. Hirschfeld, thank you for allowing me your time tonight. I appreciate it. My name is Ben Ide of Atron Development. We're the uh, owner and operator of Lincoln Park Townhomes there in Dickinson. And I'm calling to um, discuss our assessed value. Uh, we developed this property back in, I think it was 2013. It's a low-income housing tax credit property uh, developed through North Dakota Housing. Um, we have income and rent restrictions on it. We've owned and operated that property since its development. Um, <clears throat> going back to uh, the spring, we did participate in the Vanguard income appraisal process. So every year, Joe's office sends out a notice to ask for income and rent information. We sent that back. We participate in that every year. Um, waited for our assessment, got our assessment, and began working with Joe on that. We um, put together a valuation spreadsheet using the income approach that came up with a, a lower value than what it was assessed at this year. I think it was around 3.7 million. Um, said that on Joe, Joe looked at it, replied back that he's using a gross income multiplier. We, our calculation used a cap rate. Uh, I think I had 7.6% in there for a loaded cap rate, which I, state of Wyoming uses, and it's pretty consistent with uh, uh, realty rates, cap rates for uh, 2021. So we sent that back, came back with a 3.7 million value. Right now, it's the new assessment is in when, when Joe when Joe uh, has his turn, he can correct me, but I want to say it's about 5.5 million. Um, so we came back significantly lower than the current year assessment. Joe replied said he used to use a gross income multiplier, which is another approach to the, or another way to use the income approach. Um, gross income multiplier of 10 on our property, which, and this is the part that we're that we wanted to bring up to the Board of Equalization and, and hopefully get an adjustment because of. So our gross rent potential on this property is, I can pull it up right now. And Joe, I, I know you probably haven't shared most of this with the Board of Equalization because you and I have been working informally. But the, within the, our financial statements that we submitted, and the estimate of value that I sent to Joe, our gross rent potential is about 613000 And that is the maximum rent that we could get on any of our tax credit units. So we have some units that are at 60% of area median income, and then many units that are at 30% of area median income. And the rents on those are extremely low, like four or 500 bucks a month. They're really low on those 30% units. The 60% units, for whatever reason, HUD's calculation of rents for the area is higher than market rents. So each year, HUD Ben, can I interrupt you for just a moment here? Issues. I'm sorry, I heard yes, someone speaking, but I couldn't understand. It's Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, Mr. President, I apologize for the interruption. Uh, we're, I've left you, the commissioners, at a loss. He did provide the material. I neglected to bring that along. And it can certainly, if we want to take a two or three minute break here real quick, I'll go gather that. And so you've got the information. I'm sorry, I'm having, I'm having trouble hearing and understanding Joe. Joe, I don't know if you can get closer to the mic. And I, Ben, I was just asking the, uh, the commission if they would like to, a minute or two recess here for me to go get your material. I neglected to bring that with me. Did you hear him, Ben? No, I'm really sorry. I don't know. I can hear everyone else just fine, but I can't hear Joe. I'm sorry. Okay. He wants to, to go get some additional information to provide to the commission. For Take him about two minutes, he said. 
Okay, sure, that's fine. Do you want me to just, just wait just, until he gets back? Now? Yeah, ju just hold on. So. Okay, will do. I'll just hold the line. Thank you. I have your information in front of us now that you provided to Mr. Hirschfeld. Okay, good. So if, if, if I may continue, um, I understand the methods that he's using to value the property. Um, I think the, my concern is, and I was starting to touch on this before we, uh, before we stopped earlier, but our gross rent potential that's reflected within our financial statements is the maximum that HUD will permit. HUD does the calculation county by county for every county across the country and says, this is what your, what your maximum rents are. In the case of Stark County, and this is a net rent that doesn't include utilities, um, so the gross rent would be higher, but for a two bedroom, it's $1,320. And for a three bedroom, it's $1,526. So for our apartments, there's no way that we can rent them for that much um, for a multitude of reasons. But what ends up happening in our financial statements is we look at what those units will produce in a normal market. And I don't, I'm reluctant to call it a market rent because I think what we can rent our tax credit units for is less than a comparable market rate because of the administrative burden that our residents have to go through to qualify for one of our units. So in other words, all else being equal, if they have to jump through hoops for our unit, it's worth less. Um, but we figured that the market rents were 900 for a two and 1100 for a three bed. I know there's some that are much higher than that. There's probably some that are lower, but for this type of unit and the um, requirements that our tenants have to go through, that's what we set the market rents at. So the difference between the tax credit maximum rents of 1320 and 1526 and our established market rents of 900 and 1100 is what's known as loss to lease. And that shows up kind of in the, the vacancy section. And the reason that our financials are set up this way is because our investors want to see that. They want to see the maximum tax credit rent and then what our actual achievable rents are below that tax credit limit. So going back to the gross income multiplier, when Joe and I started sorting through this, I showed a gross income of, 613,000 um, less vacancy and some other things. And it ended up by basically our gross income was overstated is what I'm contending by the amount of the loss to lease. And if you look at our actual gross income before vacancy, less a 10% vacancy allowance so this is, I don't know if you have the email that I sent to Joe yesterday, but I did a calculation within the body of that email. Our total potential income was 613905 You back out the loss to lease, which is an amount of rent that is not achievable by us, basically. You come up with a gross income before vacancy, take a 10% vacancy. We had higher vacancy at the property last year. Again, there were a number of reasons for that. Some of it was staffing. Much of it was staffing. We had a lot of trouble uh, keeping good managers and maintenance guys there, and that affected us and drove our vacancy up. But just for the sake of this calculation, I used a 10% vacancy to kind of eliminate that, that variable. Came up with a adjusted growth income of 409583 Um Using a gross income multiplier of 10, that would result in a value of uh, 4 million, is it, uh, $95,830, which is what I ask that the board set our assessed value of that. Could you, could um, you, thank you. Could you dial us or repeat that, that request amount? I'm sorry, I lost you again. Uh, repeat the request amount. 
I lost the audio. I, I'm talking right into this phone. So, um, four mi uh, could you re request the, I mean, give us that number again of your request? No, can you give us the, the amount again, the four million that you're requesting? Four million what? Uh, four million ninety-five thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars. Four million ninety-five thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars. Thank you. Mr. Hirschfeld. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, historically the low income housing tax credit uh, properties and we have a few in town have not been given any obsolescence like other low-income properties because of the tax credits uh, that's considered to be the benefit that offsets that so they've been valued just like every other property in town the increase that they got this year is based on the change in the market uh, when we look at the gross income multiplier compared to their income that supports the the increase in value from the market and so we were comfortable with with where we were at with that based on that. And so if this commission would like to, to act differently than previous commissions and give some uh, an, an adjustment to the low income housing tax credit properties, that's certainly something we could do moving forward and, and make sure that we give that to all the properties. And certainly if you wanna make an adjustment to this, that's all, also at your discretion. So if you gave that adjustment right now, what, I mean, you can calculate that, right? From the what you gave the all the other properties that adjustment Th there was no no negative adjustment okay. so th they're valued similarly to every other apartment and the the increase they got is the same increase that every other apartment in town received okay. there was nothing done to this apartment that wasn't done to every other apartment including the other low-income housing tax credit properties so well, what would you say the I don't know, because this is almost a million dollars. Yeah, that's where I'm going with this. Too. Yeah. And, and I mean. That's a 25% increase. Yeah. Low income housing is a significant need in the community. Um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, again, like if this discourages that type of investment in the community. Um, but yeah, that twenty-five percent hike is that—that's significant. This is where the gross income multiplier isn't always the best way to go, in my opinion, because it depends on the expenses. I mean, they've got and they're capped, they're capped on their possible rent. I'm not a fan of gross income multiplier in the first place, but it's a good way to get an idea of value. I, I just need to hear why the justification for the 25% increase. It's strictly based off the sales. So if we go back, if this is awake here yet. So Mr. Hirschfeld, I guess my question would be is if this property were to sell to somebody else, would it have to maintain its low income housing? For 30 years. Yes. Okay. From the, from its inception, 30 years. Okay. But unlike some of the other programs, this one's different in that they receive the, the tax credit. So to, to use another type of property, the uh, USDA rural housing one, limits uh like one of the properties that we just worked with well it carlos ended up buying it and it's off the program now but limited that owner to seventeen hundred dollars worth of profit and some years there was no profit because in the in the down market he wasn't able to to charge the same rent he, he couldn't beat the market rent and so he was losing money and he could never make enough to to even get to a seventeen hundred dollar profit that's what his limitations were this property has 
a different limitation and then they also have the benefit of getting the tax credit. Now certainly there are some years that maybe that's not to their benefit, but there are other years where, where it is to their benefit. And I mean, do we have any idea of what the impact of them getting a tax credit does to the value of it? I mean, is there some proven thing that says that because they, they get this tax credit, these properties are worth more? That would need to be studied, and that's why I would recommend no change now and make that part of a study this year. Previous boards, it, it, there, there was not the evidence to give them the decrease. That's why we valued them the same as everybody else. If that market has shifted and there, there is that evidence, I don't have that today to make that decision. That would some, be something we'd have to study. But Hello, this is yep. Ben here. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. We can still hear you, Ben. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, but I wasn't able to catch anything okay. that was said by the by the other members. I did hear a question about the tax credits, and if if you may allow me, um, the state of Wyoming actually has, and I realize we're not in Wyoming, um, but they have pretty clear guidance on how to value how assessors should value tax credit properties, which frankly, I mean, we, we all know how tough Joe's job is. It would make his job a lot easier. They each year issue a, uh, a spreadsheet that basically has a loaded cap rate in it with instructions in it on how to value tax credit properties specifically. And one of the things that they look at is the, uh, the value of the, the tax credits, because um, if, if you give me maybe 60 seconds, I could kind of explain how those come into the project. But basically, we apply to North Dakota Housing for tax credits. If we're successful, they give us an allocation of tax credits over 10 years. And it might be, say, 500000 per year. So over 10 years, you get $5 million in tax credits. We take those into the open market and we sell them through a process known as syndication. And if we sold them for just say 80 cents on the dollar, you never get dollar for dollar because it's gotta be some investor value there. But if we sold those 5 million in credits for 80 cents, we would get $4 million in equity that comes into the project. Now that comes in, in as equity. It doesn't have to be repaid like debt, which means we can place less debt on the project have a smaller mortgage and charge lower rents. That's the tax credit program in a nutshell. We as the owner and operator of those don't receive the tax credits. They go to an investor member. Um, now, there's still an investor in the project, they're a member in the project, um, and they're benefiting from those. But what the state of Wyoming says is if you take your uh, total allocation of annual allocation of tax credits and divide it by the number of years that the project is restricted, then that's sort of an annual value of that benefit. Um, and in this case, it'd be, I don't know, 20,000 per year in income. It's not a lot, uh, but that's one way that state of Wyoming looks at it. So hope that helps. And I heard somebody say that they're not huge fans of the gross income multiplier. I'm not either. I think a cap rate is much more appropriate in this case, a loaded cap rate, um, where maybe you normalize your expenses, which is what I attempted to do by setting the vacancy at 10%. Um, but just throwing that out there, I looked at it both ways. It was the value was lower using a cap rate versus the gross income multiplier. The gross income multiplier produces a uh, higher value um, and that's what we've asked for is the use of the gross income multiplier based on our actual adjusted gross income taking out the loss to lease. Mr. President. Mr. Alderman. Mr. Hirschfeld, do we have a, do you have any idea how other municipalities in North Dakota value these? Is it this with the gross income multiplier like you use or um, do, I mean, do you have any other resources you can maybe tap into to 
see how this is valued in other places? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Oderman, uh, the, the, the additional basis that I have to, to go off of is back in 2011, 12, 13, when there was a large number of these properties coming to Western North Dakota because of the oil boom, uh, there were some being placed in, in the Fargo area, quite a few more up in Minot, we had some here. North Dakota, the state of North Dakota does not allow for, they don't disallow for it either, a discount for low-income housing tax credit properties. There are other ones that we have to value differently that limits the valuation. These are not one of those. Uh, my not, uh, when Kevin Turnus was there, he's since retired, Ben Huskett, Fargo has as well. But when we sat down, uh, we also sat down with uh, uh, Bob Ayler from Vanguard, see what do other states do, and it, it's just about different, it, it's different between every state, at least the ones that we looked at. But to, to answer your question, the, the recommendation from those two gentlemen from Bob Ayler was because of the tax credit, because there's some additional income because of that, that to value them like every other property. That's where their value at, you know, remains in that tax credit. And so there's some benefit to joining that program. That's their, their benefit to joining that program. Now, certainly we can change that and, and go a different route. I'm not prepared to offer an opinion of value at this time and certainly look at the data a little more, see, you know, how they sell. We'd probably have to go outside of North Dakota uh, borders to find sales like that. They don't sell very often, so and see what the, the difference, if there is one, between market value properties and, and these properties. Mr. Hirschfeld, I mean, I think he's willing to use the gross income multiplier, but he wants credit for his lost lease expense affecting his gross income. I mean, is there an issue with that? So it, he's asking for it to be taken off, have the vacancy taken off, in my understanding, well, that's how he's coming that's, to that, his total, yeah. is with the 10% vacancy. Well, I think that lost the lease would. Right. Well, and, and I don't <laughs> have his card in front of me or his value. I mean, I think we could look that up in the back, but if I remember correctly, the gross income multiplier, it comes right near with where we're already at. It supports that. Yeah. Now, I, I would say my recommendation would be to Keep the value as is until we can figure this out. That's what I was just going to say because his his proposed request is actually lower than the previous value, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to. For, I, I'd like to maybe <coughs> keep it at the same as, as the previous year while we explore different options for these low income properties. So. Once this meeting's over, though, what's what's his opportunity then? Well, and my recommendation, certainly take it as you will, would be to leave the value <coughs> as presented today. He still has the opportunity over the next two years to file an abatement. With your direction, if that's if we want to look at these, and, and I would suggest looking at the whole class of low-income housing tax properties, not just his, because we're basically making a decision for all of them, is that we decide which route we want to go and then there's all always the abatement process that they could follow so if next year we come in and we say all right low-income housing properties tax credit properties we're going to give a 10 percent additional office lessons to we can catch that as a class and move forward from that and there's always the opportunity to file an abatement if they want to try and go back on those as well uh, that, i mean my only concern with that is that we're burdening him with a 25 percent increase in one year to his value. If, if there's five or seven other properties, though, we're then inviting them to file an abatement to get the same discount. If if we believe this to be warranted, I don't have any information to support or disprove it. I, well, I mean, that, well, and that's where I'm at. I mean, we don't have any information to support anything. The new value, the old value, other than what he supplied just a few minutes ago. Again, commissioners, we have the option of staying with the true value, going with the representative's request, or setting a value as this Board of Equalization deems appropriate.
I guess I'm firmly on the fence here. I'm not, I'm not opposed to Commissioner Friedrich's approach, but I'm also not opposed to um, Mr. Hirschfeld's approach of the abatement process. But uh, because I mean, I, th I think f for the most part, there's a consensus here that it's probably not accurate. But we really have no idea what to adjust it to at this time until we do that exploratory that's why I, I made the recommendation to stay at where it was so it's still higher than his request and it's but are you talking that the, the, the 4.458 yeah, yeah the four million four hundred oh. and yeah. I thought when you said this no. leave it as is you're talking no, the 21 his, value his 20 yes his 21 value is four million four hundred twenty two value I'm sorry. yeah no 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 I guess I'm just or be somewhere in between so it's and that would still allow them to file for an abatement if they the assessor's office comes back with additional data yeah I just I have our I mean I have a hard time accepting the 22 value just because I don't have anything to see how we came to that so with that in mind, I guess, unless we can magically provide something to understand it better, I would make a motion to return it to the 21 value of 4,458,700 until we can take a look at this. We have a motion on the table by Commissioner Frederick to place the 2021 valuation as the 2022 valuation, which is 4,458,700. Mr. Friedrich, would you entertain a friendly amendment to that? Sure. Uh, meet in the middle and go 4.944050. So $4,944,050. That would be dead center of the two numbers. And then they could always do the abatement request. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I'd like to hear the applicants' thoughts, thoughts on that. Yeah. Before I amend. Then could you could you hear what the the motions are? I I heard a motion to put it to the 2021 value, which is about 4.4 4 million. I didn't hear anything beyond that, though. There's a recommendation to amend that to 4.944 million to be basically in the middle between the, the 21 and 22 values. So. Yeah, you know, part of the part of the challenge with this is we had a really tough year there um, at that property, and some of it is self-inflicted. I, you know, I admit to that. We had a lot of management challenges. But the amount of the increase between last year and this year is just tough to swallow. It's it's uh, going from 4.4 .4 to over 5.5. .5. I don't know what that is as a percentage. It's got to be 20, 25 percent. And you know when we're struggling to pay our mortgage there, to have a 25 percent increase in the property taxes is is tough to swallow, especially given that. Um, you know, we submitted all of our income information. We submit it every single year. And last year, I thought the taxes were probably a little bit high, but uh, didn't appeal them. Um, and this year, just seeing the increase, it's, I think it's too much. And after having dove into it, you know, the numbers are not, are not really too difficult to understand if you just look at the financial information which we submitted to Joe, which showed the gross rent potential of 613,000, you back out 158,000 in loss to lease, it leaves the, the gross income before vacancy, back out your vacancy and then apply the gross income multiplier of 10, which in my opinion, I think is probably too high for a property like this, but even accepting that, it puts our value at 4,095,000. And that's what I that's what I asked for earlier. It's using the old the the assessing office's own calculation, but just putting the right data into it. Um, so I'd like to 
not a compromise. I don't think that a tax increase is warranted based on the method of assessment being used and the data that's been submitted going back over the last 10 years, really. Mr. Pr Mr. President, I'd withdraw my friendly amendment and second his motion. Okay, we have a motion on the table to put the 2022 valuation at four million four hundred fifty-eight thousand seven hundred, which was the assessed value or the yes, the assessed value of 2021. It has been seconded by Commissioner Oderman. Any further discussion, commissioners? Mr. President, if I may, just an opportunity to play devil's advocate here because we won't get this one back. Let's say my research comes back and shows that the 2022 value is accurate, but we've already de decreased it. And then we have the other low income housing tax properties come in for an abatement to get this lowered. If we don't give that to them and it, we would have information suggesting that it was not warranted, but if we don't give them the same discount we give this property here, then we're being uh, uh, capricious and uh, arbitrary and capricious in our valuation. And so we would be giving a discount to additional properties that's not warranted, or p possibly if they come forward, they would have to go through that process. So that's why my recommendation remains to leave the value, give us the two years, it won't take us that long to review it. And if it needs corrected, we'll get in contact with Mr. With Mr. Ide, help him through the abatement process and it'll go right through. But I, I hate making adjustments when I don't have the information to support or discount it and I understand the low-income part of this but there's a reason why nobody else in the state is given this discount and I th think the data probably supports that it remains where it's at I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding so when I look at their financial statement 613,000 is the max rent they can take in correct that's what they state I can neither confirm nor deny that okay did you hear my question uh, I heard you say 613000 is the max rent that we could take in, which is based on the tax credit program. That's correct. Okay, so you show that on your statement just as a number of what the possibility could be. But when you, the loss to lease is, when you deduct that out, that's your actual gross. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. The loss to lease represents the difference between the maximum tax credit rent and the achievable market rents. Okay, so when you apply the gross income multiplier, you're saying we applied it to the 613 and we should have applied it to the lesser number. That's correct. That, that would be incorrect. Why? why? They didn't, they, if 148 you, is, not, is income they didn't get. We have a value of 5.5 million roughly. So if you look at his, the spreadsheet here that's got the blue on it, the second, the third and fourth pages, I think they end up being the same. So you see his potential gross income of 613,000. They then take their 10% vacancy off of that of 61,000. That gives you the effective gross of 552,000. That's the value that I took the 10 GIM against. That would support the $5.5 million value we have. That's without any of the tax credits being added back to the property. So there's additional income. I'm not sure where he's getting down to 400,000. I don't have that calculation in front of me. Did you hear that? Ben, did you hear that? No, I didn't, and I'm sorry, I have to admit, I feel a little bit at a disadvantage not being able to hear Joe, but I would entertain any question that you might have, or maybe if you could summarize it so I could respond. So this is his sheet. That's his sheet. Can you explain your, your sheet on how you came up with the value? Because when I look at your sheet, this is Commissioner Frederick, you have the 613.905, and you've only deducted the vacancy allowance of 10%. You haven't deducted the the loss to lease part in here. So can you walk us through that so we understand? Yeah, so there are two of these sheets that were put together. The one that you're looking at that's number one through eight on the left hand side with potential gross income at the top. If that number is six six thirteen nine oh five, 
This was the very first run that I took I to putting together a value using the income right, approach. So and I sent this to, the same thing. to Joe. And what this represents, you're right, um, I that I did not back out the loss to lease. I should have. I should have taken it out. It should have been backed out of the potential gross income and then had the vacancy allowance applied and and then arrive at the value using a cap rate. That's what this is showing is uh, the value using a cap rate. If your value at the bottom is 3.7 million, um, 3,723,959, that was the very first attempt that I made at valuing this using the income approach, using a cap rate. Joe replied to me, said, well, I'm actually using a gross income multiplier, uh, which, it's sort of a different way of, of looking at it. And I said, okay, well, let me let me try that and see what number I come up with. And there's, I don't know if you were provided the email for me um, or if you have the financials. I'm not sure exactly what is in front of you. But using the gross income multiplier, which was my second attempt at creating a value, uh, you have 613905 in total gross rent potential based on tax credit limits. Our loss to lease is 158813 So those are amounts that we're not going to be able to collect. You know, the tax credit program could say rent in Dickinson are $10,000 for a two-bedroom and $20,000 for a three-bedroom. That doesn't mean that we can get that. So that's, that's the purpose of the loss to lease is to account for the difference between tax credit rents and achievable rents. And that amount is 158,813, which leaves uh, gross income before vacancy of 455,092. I applied a 10% vacancy factor to that, which was 45,509, which left adjusted gross, in, adjusted gross income of $409,583. And then if you apply a gross income multiplier of 10 to that, that's how I arrived at the $4,095,830 value. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. And that's how I understood it, I guess, so. And Mr. President, commissioners, another option available to us is to move forward with the rest of the the valuation hold his valuation into another uh, commission meeting night where we can make sure where everybody's got all the right information in front of them and and approach this again with maybe a little bit better uh, basis behind it so is your argument that the loss lease loss to lease is not their true income deduction my argument right now is I've got sales to support the 25% increase and that was the basis of the increase to everything over the last 10 years, we've been valuing low-income housing tax credit pro problems, properties the same way we have uh, standard rate properties. And tonight we're looking to change that and that's not how this property was valued initially. We're looking to change the complete it's philosophy of how, uh, how we value these properties. Some of that, sales are the basis of the gross income multiplier, or they should be. So the fact that you may have had sales that were at a higher per unit value, that should be taken into account with the gross income multiplier and then applied to our property individually. Every, every tax credit property is different. Every affordable housing development has different restrictions, which is why it makes it difficult to apply, you know, a blanket increase across the board to all the tax credit properties. They're all a little bit different, um, but if you have sales, the gross income multiplier should be based on those sales and then applied to properties individually. Mr. President, can, can we pull this one out and talk about it at a future meeting before the deadline and make sure that we get these this stuff squared away? Do we have a future meeting before the deadline? <laughs> well, when's the deadline? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioners, we have to transfer all of our data over to the uh, county by... Uh, their uh, J uh june meeting so it'll be there june 7th yeah that's how yeah. i read it so june we, 7th. if we have this back to you the first meeting in may that gives us three weeks two weeks two full weeks maybe three weeks here to 
sit down, hammer this out, make sure that we put a packet together so we're all following the same eight pages that I don't have here in front of me tonight, you don't have in front of you, and we're all trying to make sense out of, out of something that's not in front of us. I would agree that we... That this seems like we need to look at this as a, as a whole and to understand better how the low-income taxation is um, without making a, a, a single decision for one property and then having differing issues come from that. So I, I think we should get the full picture of this before we make a decision. You want to withdraw on table? Yeah, I mean, if, if we can accommodate this so we don't burden him with this value if we're wrong for a whole year, then yes, I would be open to moving this to another meeting for us to review. So I would with rescind my motion with that. Okay. We have a rescinded motion for that valuation Mr. ID, we're going to table your uh, discussion on your property to our next regular city commission meeting when we'll be able to have all the information in front of us to make a, a, a better decision on your valuation. And hopefully we have the audio. Okay, thank you. Know. I appreciate that. I, I support that decision. What's up? Okay, is there anyone else on the phone that wishes to discuss with the Board of Equalization their valuation of their property? Anyone else on the phone? So Mr. Hirschfeld, we've made one adjustment this evening or this afternoon to Mr. Dolitsky's property. So you'll have to make an adjustment to that report. Um, we have made the, any changes to valuation and assessments of real property upon the roll and increased or diminished the assessed value. Therefore, it shall be reasonable and adjust to tender taxation uniform according to North Dakota Century Code. Um, we've had people apply. We have no properties to add to the list. No properties to add, no. We also have a list, commissioners, in your packets of all the properties that are exempt. So with this tabled property, do we need to not complete this Board of Equalization. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, before I answer that question, I do want to circle back to that uh, Mr. Uh, Messel that was here initially that spoke with uh, my staff. Uh, from what I understand with his, he uh, understands the increase in his valuation. He's all right with that value moving forward, so we can include this uh, in tonight's work. He does have a couple questions for me. That doesn't pertain to the value that I will address with him later. But as we've done in the past, and I'll defer to Mrs. Wenka, we can, should be able to move forward with all the values done tonight, one change, and then with one property still remaining to be, to be heard. Correct. Okay. Because no reductions after, after this board hearing, so. Mr. President, what's the, what's the, maybe this is a question for Mrs. Wenka, but what's the appropriate motion here then? Commissioner Oderman, uh, I would recommend that you make a motion as summarized by Mr. Hirschfield with regard to accepting those properties that have been uh, with no uh, contest, I would say, uh, with the situation of adjusting Mr. Doletsky's property and then, of course, tabling the Dickinson Apartments complex that we just discussed. So moved. <laughs> Before we uh, approve that motion we also need a motion to approve all the exemptions the ones that are the provided list for you oh the exempted okay. properties. i'll rescind my motion and move to approve the exemptions yes yeah, so you have a 2022 real property exemptions mm -hmm. 
list here. So for your review, the motion by Commissioner Odeman is to accept those exemptions. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the exemptions, state aye. 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 Pose, same sign. Now to your other motion, Mr. Oderman. Yes, I would make that same motion that Mrs. Wanko so eloquently stated. Do we have that? Uh, Could you read that back to us? Documented. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the secretary back there to have that. I know it's on video somewhere, but uh, I want to make sure that. So we are going to approve the roles as presented with one adjustment to Mr. Doletsky's tabling, Mr. Idy's property, and that should be it. Correct. Correct. So, and that is Mr. Oderman's motion. I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Sobolok. Any further discussion? Not will vote. Mr. Oderman? Aye. Mrs. Sobolok? Aye. Mr. Frederick? Aye. Ms. Walla? Aye. Chair votes aye. And that should complete the Board of Equalization for this afternoon. The next motion I would need is for adjournment. So moved. Second. We are adjourned.